to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. Uh, this is episode number 722. I'm in uh, Grays Lake, Illinois, again, uh, here by myself in the studio. We've got a bunch of great podcasts and uh, a host of excellent guests lined up on the schedule. But today we're bringing to you another conference address from our recent theology conference held down at Providence OPC in Pflugerville, Texas. Our theme this year was the promise of life, God's plan for his people in the covenant of works. And we compare and contrast uh, Reformed theology on uh, the covenant of works and the doctrine of the image of God with a variety of other basic, you know, architectonic approaches, such as that of uh, Roman Catholicism and modernism. So we're bringing to you today uh, the address by Danny Olinger, he, it's titled Gerhardus Voss and the Covenant of Works. Now, Danny, of course, serves as general secretary for the committee uh, of home of uh, the committee on Christian Education for the OPC, and he is also the president uh, for the committee for the historian. And uh, he's a tremendous uh, thinker and uh, writer in his own right. You may know him from such books as Gerhardus Voss. Reformed Biblical Theologian, Confessional Presbyterian, the book that we published a few years ago. Uh, And uh, this book has been moving significantly well. We're so delighted uh, that uh, people have been interested in this book. We've we've shipped over a thousand of them. And most recently, uh, Danny and I were able to attend a really wonderful conference down in Wheaton at uh, Harbor House, Wheaton, part of uh, Wheaton College, and uh, they hosted an event for the Presbyterian Scholars Group. Uh, the, the conference was the Presbyterian Scholars Conference, hosted by Jeff McDonald. He's been on the program before. And uh, it's a very small event, but a very collaborative and interesting one. And I had presentations from Daryl Hart, uh, Mark Knoll, George Marsden. Uh, there, there were many people there, Brad Longfield, several others. So it was really insightful. I was able to pop in. Uh, for a day. Got to see Steve Nichols and talk to him uh, from Reformation Bible College. And uh, he was reacting to uh, Daryl Hart's biography of Machen. They had a little panel discussion on that. It was really fun. But I bring it up uh, because not only was Danny there interacting with Daryl Hart, but Danny was honored. Uh, They selected this book as their book of the year. Now, it wasn't published this year, but uh, this was the book that they selected to honor this year, a a significant honor. And uh, we're tremendously thankful for Danny for having written the book and uh, opting to to go with us as a publisher. We're thankful for that opportunity and look forward to future opportunities. But I want to take the moment, a moment, just to uh, just to let everyone know and uh, remind people about the book. If you haven't seen it yet, if you don't have a copy and would like to get one, uh, just ring us up or head on over to reformedforum.org slash store. We have uh, copies available there at a great price. We'll ship them to you free in the U.S., and we also have copies available at amazon.com. You can find uh, find the book there as well. So again, we've, we've had four main addresses. Uh, we had a, a VIP dinner that Lane spoke at that event. Well, that, that speech or lecture or whatever will not be published. And so kind of a private special thing. So come to the next VIP dinner. Hopefully next year we'll have one. And uh, my address was published last week uh, in the podcast feed, Nature, Grace, and Covenant, The Deeper Protestant Conception and 20th Century Roman Catholicism. It's pretty dense. <laughs> After I listened again, I'm thinking, wow, I really kind of didn't pull any punches and, and just went full force right from right from the very start, right out of the gates. But uh, today we're going with the second address, Gerhardus Voss and the Covenant of Works by Danny Olinger. There are addresses by Jim Cassidy and Lane Tipton available and coming soon in the podcast feed. If you absolutely cannot wait, head on over to reformedforum.org slash RF21, RF21. One, and you can find uh, just direct links to the conference addresses, and uh, you can watch those to your heart's content immediately. But here's Danny, and uh, speaking about Gerhardus Voss and the Covenant of Works. If you had to pick one page as an entrance into the theology of Gerhardus Voss, what would it be? Now that's the uh, question that I asked to Voss devotees, uh, Richard Gaffin, uh, William Dennison, and Reform Forum's own 
Camden Busey and Lane Tipton. Now in asking, I did supply them with a suggestion. Uh, would it be Biblical Theology, page 22, or Pauline Eschatology, uh, page 169, footnote 19, or would it be some other uh, text? Well, Camden answered, my first thought is Biblical Theology 22. Lane said, probably Biblical Theology 22, but that footnote surely is astonishing. Dick Gaffin replied, one page, what a question. Your two proposals below strike me as being as good as any. And Bill Dennison responded, when you limit me to one page, which I have never thought of before, I cannot think of two better readings than your suggestions. Well, Bill uh, might not have thought of limiting Voss uh, to one page as explaining Voss's theology, but his brother Charlie did. And that's really where Charlie started in teaching me about Gerhardus Voss. He said, if you don't understand page 22 of the Biblical Theology, then you're never going to understand Gerhardus Voss's thought. He said, oh, of course, you, you'll be able to put together, uh, you know, the, the progressive and organic revelation and, and, and many other wonderful things. Uh, but you'll never truly grasp the eschatological. You'll tra never truly understand uh, eschatology preceding soteriology and what that means then for Reformed Covenant theology. Well, I know that's a lot of weight to put on page 22 of the Biblical Theology, which you will find on the handout. It's uh, the pre-redemptive and special revelation. Um, but it is essential. If you don't understand what Foss is saying here, I truly believe you're not going to understand the theology of Gerhardus Foss. So on this uh, page, Foss says that in the garden, there existed a form of special revelation that transcended the natural uh, knowledge of God. And the purpose of this revelation was to reveal to Adam the goal of his existence. Um, if Adam obeyed, uh, he would move beyond an acquaintance based on indirection to a fellowship that was full and complete. You have to think in terms of the opening of Genesis. In the garden, God came and he went. And Voss says that's an acquaintance of indirection. It's not an acquaintance that is full and complete and permanent. If Adam obeyed, he would have moved from unconfirmed goodness and blessedness uh, to confirm goodness and blessedness. If Adam had obeyed, he would move beyond the probation, beyond the probation uh, where sin was no longer possible, nor would there be, uh, nor would uh, he be subject to the consequences of sin. So Adam was to obey God's word, and uh, he was to glorify God by obeying that word, with the promise that such obedience would advance him from the estate uh, in which he was created to a higher estate. Now, Foss makes plain here on this page that this provision of a higher prospect for man was entirely an act of God's condescension and favor to man. See, as a creature, Adam was not entitled to such favor from God, and there's nothing in nature that would have revealed the prospect of the reward to him. You cannot look at the trees uh, the, uh, in the garden and, and know this. It has to be uh, revealed to Adam by God in a special uh, manner. Well, you might be asking yourself, why start here when the topic uh, that announced to you was Gerhardus Voss and the Covenant of Works? Well, it's on the next page, and we've also included that for you. On page 23 of uh, the Biblical Theology, Voss has what might seem at first to be a throwaway sentence, but it's very important for our purposes. He says, uh, in dogmatic language, uh, this pre-redemptive special revelation is commonly called 
the covenant of works. So um, that's the importance of the covenant of works to the theology of, uh, of Gerhardus Foss. So it, it's not going too far that when you're drinking out of this beautiful mug with Foss's portrait when he was a young professor at, in Grand Rapids and there's the, the eschatology precedes soteriology, it's not going too far uh, to uh, really understand that what this is, it's affirming the reformed doctrine of the covenant of works. Now, the trick with Voss is that sometimes he can go on page after page and you're wondering where's the period going to uh, appear. <laughs> now I know that. And there's other times if you just keep on reading him, he gives it to you in one sentence. Um, so here's the one sentence, and it's from the eschatology of the Psalter. There Voss declares, Insofar as the covenant of works posit for mankind an absolute goal and unchangeable future, the eschatological may be even said to have preceded the soteric religion. Now, in arguing for uh, the significance of the covenant of works, Foss was not naive. He knew that this was going against the tide in Christendom, and it definitely was going against the tide uh, end of Reformed theology. In his article, Hebrews, the Epistle of the Diatheke, Foss notes, quote, that the covenant of works, uh, or that is generally considered a dogmatic anachronism to carry the covenant idea back into the religious status of a fallen man as the Reformed theology has done in its doctrine of the covenant of works. And he goes on to say that this today is a much ridiculed doctrine. But in Voss's judgment, Reformed the theology had not erred in embracing uh, this uh, doctrine. For God always deals with man in covenant, even man in a state of of rectitude. Now, it's fascinating. So the, 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 um, uh, the Hebrews, the epistle of Diatheke uh, is essential to understanding Voss, but it's really long. It's a two-part article that's around 90 pages, and it's amazing. And it's really what you should read and not the book. So the book is the edited version by his son later on. This is where the exegetical gems are. Not that the book isn't better than anything I would ever write, but if you want to get to the, what Voss is saying in its power, um, read that more so than, read it first and then read the book uh, second. Um, but um, it's fascinating where this occurs in the article. Voss brings up the covenant of works when he wants to talk about the fact that the epistle to the Hebrews, perhaps, he, Voss says, perhaps more than any other New Testament book, develops what you might call a history of revelation. And when he makes that point, and he brings the doctrine of the, the covenant of works into play, he does so because he says that the writer to the epistle of the Hebrews is not content simply uh, to look at a, uh, the, two, uh, uh, the covenant from a soteriological point of view. Rather, says Foss, the epistle, quote, brings the covenant idea into connection with eschatology, and by doing this, first introduces into it the breadth and absoluteness that pertains to the eschatological outlook. So in other words, and Foss is not going to take the time to explain this to you at this point. He's, he's hopeful you understand this in the movement of the argument up to here, but he's going to say that it's not, in Hebrews, it's just not this contrast between the old and uh, new covenants. But rather, um, you have to also understand uh, the last days in, in the promise of entering into the Sabbath rest. And so obviously in, in chapters three and four, dealing with the Sabbath rest, you're going back to creation and the goal uh, set before man at the beginning. And so once you understand this and what Foss is saying, then he goes on to say, uh, if eschatology posits an absolute goal, which it does, and this goal corresponds 
uh, to the beginning of the world in creation, then here's what you have. According to Voss, he says, no longer a segment, but the whole sweep of history is drawn into one great perspective. And the mind is impelled to view every part in relationship to the whole. To do this means to construct a primitive theological system. Thus, eschatology becomes the mother of theology. Now, it's no surprise then that what Voss sees with the book of Hebrews as a whole, he then applies to the Apostle Paul. And he uses almost the exact same argumentation. He call, so the epistle to the Hebrews is uh, perhaps the more so than any other New Testament book, uh, that epistle of, uh, that puts forth a, a philosophy of revelation and redemption. Well, Paul, according to Voss, is the great philosopher of history. And you know what he says Paul does? This is from the article, The Theology of Paul. Paul, uh, Voss sees, uh, he says, Paul's theology exhibits a breadth and comprehensiveness that goes beyond the soteriolo soteriological. And, uh, and then he, he gives what I think is one of the most profound um, statements in, in understanding the depth of what he's saying. And, uh, and here's the thing, I, 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 I can't improve upon, I try to help you with Voss, but so many times I can't improve upon him. So I, I, I just think I need to quote him for, for you. But here's what he says, and listen to this. This is one of the great statements in, in his um, corpus. Paul is not content with giving a soteriological construction as in the contrast between the disobedience of Adam and the obedience of Christ, Romans 5, though this in itself it's one of the boldest and, and, and grandest contrasts ever drawn. But recognizing that Christ accomplishes far more than the restoration of what Adam ever lost, he places the two over against each other in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49 as the representatives of two successive stages in the carrying out of God's sublime purpose for humanity in such a way that the state of rectitude and the state of glory or by a sudden flash of light, seen in their mutual relation, detached as it were from a moment from the soteriological process intervening. So that's an incredible statement that he makes there uh, because he's saying, as, as amazing as that Romans 5 contrast is, you have to understand that Romans 5 contrast along with the contrast that's taking place in 1 Corinthians 15. And that brings into view the second option that I gave, uh, which I believe are the, the four great boss uh, uh, theologians out there. Um, the second option I gave them was the Pauline Eschatology, uh, page 169, footnote, a 19, which actually is also a footnote found, if you want to be you know, precise, that exact footnote is found in the eschatological conception of the Pauline spirit uh, on page 106. Now, it is kind of neat to put the two beside each other because Voss gives you a couple different different changes, um, but um, that footnote is where he really exegetes this text and this text then becomes pivotal for understanding creation and eschatology and for understanding uh, the covenant of, of works, uh, particularly at, from the, the New Testament. Now, he says there in that footnote uh, that in verses 42 through 44a, that there's the contrast going on between the pre-eschatological state of sin body, that's how you need to think of it, state of sin body, and the eschatological resurrection body. So you, you know the text, you know, what is so imperishable, what is raised imperishable. So he's, he's having this con contrast. But then he says in verses uh, 44b through 46, Paul changes the terms. So now he stretches back the pre-eschatological or the natural uh, to include um, unfallen Adam, and uh, the order of things at creation. And so that's where you have, is there, if there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body, thus it is written, 
The first man, Adam, becomes a living being. The last Adam becomes a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. So footnote 19 uh, is where Voss really just goes right to the heart of it and explains the contrast. And he argues there that the apostle was intent upon showing that in the plan of God from the outset, provision was made for a higher kind of body as pertaining to a higher state of existence generally. From this, the abnormal body of sin, no inference can be drawn to that effect, and, and that is the existence of another kind of body. The abnormal and the eschatological are not so logically correlated that the one can be postulated from the other, but the world of creation and the world of eschatology are thus correlated, the one pointing forward to the other. On the principle of typology, the first atom prefigures the second atom, the cyclical body, the pneumatic body, and he cites in Romans 5, 14. Well, what Voss was doing here, what he was doing with uh, creation and eschatology, what he was doing uh, with the covenant of works particularly, did not escape the attention of his longtime friend, lifelong friend, Herman Bovic. Uh, in the second volume of Herman Bovic's Reformed Dogmatics, uh, he has a discussion about the covenant of works. And it's, and it's a very enlightening discussion. And uh, Bovic observes that the covenant of works is incorporated into such 17th century Reformed confessions as the Irish Articles, the Westminster Standards, and the Hebelic Consensus Formula. But then he adds this statement, quote, but only in modern times was the doctrine of the covenant of works again understood and explained by a number of theologians in its true significance. So the question is, who are the theologians that Bobbink has in mind as explaining the covenant of works in its true significance? Well, he tells us in the footnote, uh, and in the footnote, he tells us the three Reformed theologians that he has in mind are Abraham Kuyper, Charles Hodge, and Gerhardus Voss. Uh, well, Voss, uh, if he was making a list of those three uh, Reformed theologians, uh, he would have added, I believe, Bovink to that list. In fact, uh, if I were uh, asked to, to state who I believe the influences are on Voss's development of the covenant at works, I would I'd place Bob and Kai on it. But I would also include the instruction that Voss received at, at Princeton Theological Seminaries in the mid-1880s, particularly his exposure in systematics to Francis Turton and Charles Hodge, and also to the confessional instruction of the Westminster Standards. But here's what you need to know, is that Voss takes what he's taught in the systematics and he adds to it. And he adds to it um, because of his exegetical ability. Remember what B.B. Uh, Warfield said, the great lion of Princeton. He told Louis Burkhoff once, uh, Curtis Voss, in all probability, was the greatest exegete Princeton has ever had. That's something for B.B. Warfield uh, uh, to, uh, to say. And when you go back and you look at the exegesis of this text of 1 Corinthians 15, and you look how Turretin is exegeting it, and how Hodge is exegeting it, uh, and how Bobbing is exegeting it, and then you look at how Voss is exegeting it, and you say, Oh, I think, I think Warfield's right. And, and that's not to take away, particularly from many of the positives of the two, but I'll give you an example. So Turretin. Uh, Turretin comes to this text, and he doesn't see any transition in the text. So when he gets to verse 46 uh, of the text, he believes that Paul is still, still dealing with um, the fallen body. And so this is what uh, Turretin writes. When Paul treats the animal body, Sikiko, 1 Corinthians 40, 
15, 44, 46, he does not speak of Adam's body in his innocent state, but as it was after the fall. Then you go to Bobbink, and you read Bobbink. He's much better, in, in a sense, uh, from Turretin, but here's the point that Bobbink's driving to in his exegesis. He believes that the text proves that, quote, the whole creation, including the creation of man, was infralapsarian. Hodge. Hodge is a little bit better than, than Bobbink, a little bit better than, much better than Turretin. But you end up reading Hodge here, and it becomes much like a scholastic discussion of lower and, and higher natures. But Voss is intrigued by Hodge. And uh, Voss has this, almost again, this throwaway comment, which is so important uh, for our understanding. Um, he writes, uh, uh, actually like five or six pages after the deeper Protestant conception, uh, where that comes up in volume two. But he writes that Hodge, quote, asserts that scripture nowhere teaches explicitly that Adam's body was immortal in the sense in which the heavenly bodies will be. And then he says, see 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 42 through 52. But then Foss adds, one must, of course, concede this to him. And one could go even further and say that according to the representation of all the data of Scripture, Adam would have first received this immortality of 1 Corinthians 15 as the reward for perseverance in the covenant of works. See, Foss is tying together this exegesis here um, in 1 Corinthians 15 with what we know from systematics in the covenant of works. Now, um, having said that, um, if you did take, however, um, uh, Foss's reformed dogmatics and you opened them up to where he's uh, talking about the covenant of works, if I had to pick the one person that is influencing him there the most, it still would be Turretin. Even though Turretin didn't exegete that, those verses too great. As a matter of fact, you can do it. It's so amazing now that we have Turretin and Foss both in, uh, both in English. For those of you under the age of 40, you have no idea what this means. So in the 1980s, when you know, uh, you're sitting there thinking, okay, I need to learn Latin. I desperately need to learn Latin. I'll never get anywhere in theology unless I learn Latin. Uh, because you know, uh, these things are in Latin. And so uh, suddenly, you know, Turton is translated into English. Um, or if you're like me, I'm, I have a twofold dilemma in the 1980s. I need to learn Dutch. I need to, need to learn Dutch because I'll never read, uh, be able to read Foss's dogmatics unless I learn Dutch. And so now they're translated into English. So it's amazing uh, to have these translations now of Turton and, and Voss and and actually, uh, you could add to the list in the 1980s, you're sitting there thinking, I'll never be able to read Bobbing. I mean, uh, I, our reasonable faith, you know, the, the title that, that Urbans gave it, this is amazing, I want to read more. So now you have all three of these amazing systematics at your disposal. But if you take Foss and you open him up, and you take Turd and open him up, it is obvious that's what Foss was doing. I'll give you one example. So, in this section, in which um, the question is, how do the covenant of works and the covenant of grace agree? I'm going to give you Turton's answer first, and then I'm going to read you Voss's answer. How do the covenant of grace and the covenant of works agree? Turton, in their author, who in each case is God, to whom alone belongs the right of making a covenant with the creature. Voss, they agree in the author, who, is both, who in both is God, to whom alone belongs the right to enter into such a covenant with the creature. Secondly, the covenant of works and grace agree Turton in the contracting parties, God and man. Foss, they agree in the contracting parties, namely God and man. Third, the covenant of works and grace agree Turton in the general end, the glory of God. Foss, they agree, third, in the general purpose, namely the glorifying of God. Four, the covenant of works and grace agree, Turton, 
in the extrinsic form because a restipulation is annexed to each. False. Four, they agree in the internal, external form, namely requirement and counter requirement or requirement and promise. And then five, uh, how do they agree? Turretin, in the promise which is life, happiness, heavenly and eternal. False. Five, in the content of the promise, namely heavenly, eternal blessedness. Now, I'm not going to go through the list uh, how he copies from Turretin and how they disagree, because there, Turton gives like nine aspects, and Voss only chooses five of them. So that would be a fascinating paper in and of itself on why Voss chooses five, and it's obvious he's choosing them and why he doesn't choose uh, the other four. But um, as uh, uh, Camden uh, expressed in the last lecture, um, there, there is this dependence upon uh, the, uh, Turton um, in, in that Voss uh, has. And uh, according to Turretin, if, if Adam had obeyed the command of God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would have merited uh, eternal life because that is what God promised in the pact. So it's ex pacto merit that's in view. And, then so, and so with Voss agreeing with this, um, th what you have to understand then is Voss is putting forth a historical understanding of what's taking place here. And it's not going to be a philosophical or theological understanding, which, which, which some ha have done. Um, now, where can you see this in Voss's writings? Well, you can see it in his dogmatics, and then you can see it in his, his incredible article, uh, The Doctrine of the Covenant in Reformed Theology. And what you have to understand these are written at exactly the same time. So um, he, he, this is something that's definitely on his, his mind. Uh, in the uh, dogmatics, Foss argues that Adam, by nature, was obligated uh, to obey God without any right to reward. And further, if he sinned, this natural relationship all, already demanded he must be punished by God. Graciously, however, God added to this natural relationship a covenant with positive elements, the positive elements uh, such as reward and uh, immutability. And so uh, the right to a glorious reward did not proceed from the natural relationship of Adam to God, but once there is the agreement that there is something positive, a special condescension of God in these matters, then there's also acceptance of the covenant of works in principle. So that's Foss's basic position. But um, I won't get into this at length, but if your ears were thinking in terms of, of Klein and Murray, and uh, you might think of, of, of probably better stated for what I'm gonna say next, maybe Klein and Shepard and some others, listen to what Voss says on the implications of this when it comes to imputation. Uh, this is what he also says uh, in uh, regard to the covenant of works and then imputation. He's, he continues that imputa imputation of both the sin of Adam and the righteousness of Christ rests on the covenantal relationship that Adam and Christ maintain as the federal heads of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, respectively. But the imputation of Christ's righteousness to believers... Um, partakes of Christ fulfilling the terms of the covenant of works. Said Foss, the covenant of grace is nothing other than a covenant of works accomplished in Christ, the fulfillment of which is given to us by grace. Now he expands upon that, but he doesn't do it in the second volume. Because in the second volume, he's dealing with creation and anthropology. You have to get to the fourth volume uh, where he's dealing with soteri soteriology to pick up the argument. And this is what Voss says then in the fourth volume of his dogmatics. According to Voss, Christ is the covenant head of his people in a covenant of grace. However, Christ does not begin his work as covenant head in a covenant of grace in a manner that has nothing to do with that which was earlier, writes Voss. In back of the covenant of grace lies the covenant of works, 
which may not just be pushed aside, but must be removed judicially, that the debt incurred through the breaking of the covenant of works must be discharged. At the same time, however, the covenant of works, which was violated by Adam, must be carried out. The benefit of the covenant of works must be obtained. And here's the punchline that goes to the modern times in the debates that have occurred uh, in recent generations. Foss then says, this gives us the distinction between the passive and active obedience of Christ. So it's very important to pick up. Uh, if you want to weigh into these controversies, I think your heart is Foss might be providing a pretty good path uh, going forward. Well, his article, uh, The Doctrine of the Covenant in Reformed Theology, you know, you know uh, like Bill Dennison says, we often don't think about one page. Um, and, and I actually have always uh, told people, well, in, or, in through the, uh, uh, the sermons, Grace and Glory. Um, but if you had one article, I would be torn whether the doctrine of the covenant or reformed theology or the, uh, the, the Pauline conception of the eschatological spirit would be the one. But if you really want to understand Gerhardus Foss, you better live in this article right here, the doctrine of the covenant in reformed theology. And there he gives a historical look of what's going on with the, uh, of the, the uh, covenant of works in reformed theology. And he makes this observation that he realizes that many people believe that the covenant of works owes its start to the post-reformational period. And, and he really wants to combat that. And he says, if this is taken to mean that, that previously this doctrine had not been worked out in every detail and was not presented in all clarity as was the case later, then there is some truth to it. But whoever has the historical sense to be able to separate the mature development of a thought from its original sprouting and does not insist that a doctrine be mature at birth will have no difficulty recognizing the covenant of works as an old reformed doctrine. So what he does, so he's giving this address. It's the opening of, of, of the uh, uh, 1891 calendar school year at the, the Theological School of Grand Rapids. So he's addressing uh, a, a Dutch audience and he's delivering this uh, lecture in, in Dutch. And so he wants to make sure that he covers the continental theologians, and, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so he cites the contributions of uh, the mid 16th century Heidelberg theologians, Ursinus and Olivanius uh, on this doctrine. But this is what's really bold. Think about this. In, in this audience, he then goes out of his way uh, in applause uh, for the Westminster divines. He really singles them out. And in some ways, I think he's telling, it's almost like, you know, in three years, I might become Presbyterian because I love what the Westminster divines say here so much. He, he might have had that in the back of his mind. But he says, the Westminster Confession of Faith is the first Reformed confession in which the doctrine of the covenant is not br merely brought in from the side, but is placed in the foreground and has been able to permeate at almost every point. And then, and then he, 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 he tries to give a little historical lay of the land. And so the Westminster Confession of Faith in the 1640s, and he tries to make sure uh, that it's distance from some, some Lutheran works that are going on. And he tries to give the due that he really sees, uh, the two people that he really thinks the Westminster Defiance are looking at are James Usher, who had been the primary author of the Irish Articles uh, in 1615. But he also is just enamored with the Scottish theologian Robert Rolick. And he really likes the way uh, Rolick has put forth uh, the doctrine of the covenant of works and so um, he said, thinks that those two are, um, are informing the defines. And what's interesting, in the last five years, there have been some reformed historians who can't come to the same conclusion uh, that Foss has in regard to, to Usher and Rolick being influential in that regard. Um, but he then asked the, uh, the great question of, uh, um, um, in regard to uh, 
the, uh, why am I dealing with the historical an uh, antecedents when aren't we just talking with, uh, with the Reformation as a return to Scripture? And this is where he gets in then to being polemical in regard to, he says, well, of course the Lutherans love the, the Scriptures, and it was a return to the Scripture, so why did the Reformed end up with this emphasis upon the covenant, covenant of works and covenant of grace, and the Lutherans uh, did not. And he comes to the conclusion it's because um, the Reformed and Lutherans have different uh, emphases. So the uh, Lutheran emphasis is, is more upon man. The question that the Lutheran asked is, what must I do to be saved? And so thankful, Boss, you know, says for the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That's not the question that the Reformed asked. The Reformed asked, how is God to be glorified? And that does include <laughs> justification by faith. But it's two different questions and it's two different answers. And, um, and so that takes Foss then, and again, this is how he circles back then, to the covenant of works. And um, so he's asking the question about the original state of man. So I don't think it's going too far in reading Gerhardus Foss to always have lingering in the back of your mind the nature of man and the destiny of man. And for Gerhardus Foss, um, you need to answer those questions rightly. And so he always, in his writings, particularly in his early writings, he has four groups of, uh, of, of, of Christendom in view. So he has the Pelagians in view and what they think about the nature and destiny of man. He has the Lutherans in view, what they think about the nature and destiny of man. Uh, he has the Roman Catholics in view in that regard and he has the Reformed in, in view. So he says, when we compare the representations of the original state of man as they have been developed by the different theological traditions, there immediately arises a fundamental difference of great importance for the covenant of works. And so this is where Foss, again, he is really saying um, the Westminster divines got the covenant right. And he's pretty passionate about it. And he's going to, even in this setting, in a continental setting, he's going to try to demonstrate that. So he, he goes to the Pelagians. And the Pelagians believe that man had been given his destiny at creation. That is moral neutrality accompanied by a freedom of the will. So what Christ does is remove the obstacles which hinders man in the exercises of his free will. So you know what Foss is saying right there? Oh, this is dreadful. <laughs> You know, um, this is totally missing the nature of man at creation in every which way and totally missing the destiny of man. So Foss moves on to the Lutherans. And he, he, and he says uh, Lutheranism, um, even though um, it does have these aspects that we might agree with on creation and the image of God, uh, 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 even though uh, it, it, it does this, um, uh, it really messes up uh, in regard to man's destiny. So you have to understand, again, my manner and all things Foss is truly Charlie Dennison. Uh, for about a decade, he, every week, just taught me about Foss. And so when Bar uh, Charlie got here, you have to understand that he's, he was a child of the 60s. And so to him, this was his opportunity to talk about Joni Mit Mitchell in Woodstock. Back to the garden. <laughs> <laughs> That's the anthem <laughs> that, you know, Charlie was just, so he had the best uh, Joe Cocker invitation I've ever seen, but Joni Mitchell's song was the, so the two songs that Charlie would obsess about in the Bostian sense was that and John Lennon's Imagine. And so he would, I mean, I think you could get up Charlie preaching sermons about them, but, but uh, um, you know, Imagine There's No Heaven, uh, but, uh, but Joni Mitchell to him was just as bad in trying to get back to the garden. Um, uh, because uh, that's not the destiny of man. Because you understand, if the garden is uh, the goal, then um, you never get beyond the probation. And if you ever, never get beyond the probation, what does that mean for the fifth point of Calvinism? Um, 
there's no perseverance. So this is how Voss explains it. For Lutherans, precisely because man's destination had already been reached before the fall in Adam, Christ can do nothing but restore what was lost in Adam. And since the destination already realized was fully compatible with mutability and the possibility of falling, the sinner who had been brought back to his destination by Christ must necessarily have to remain at that level. Lutheran theology is therefore wholly consistent when it teaches the apostasy of the saints. So Foss says, look, so thankful for justification by faith alone, so thankful for the Reformation, but Lutheranism's got problems. It's got problems in that it doesn't make the glory of God primary, and it has problems because the garden's the goal. It teaches the apostasy of the saints. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that through the work of the second Adam and the covenant of grace, we are moved beyond that probation. So, um, so Foss takes this on polemically here. And again, it's very helpful to understand the totality of his writings in, in, if you understand that part of, um, of that article. But he anticipates some problems. He anticipates some modern problems. Um, he states that the objection might arise that Adam was a creature and could never achieve eternal life in the covenant of works, even if he had sustained the terms of the probation. He writes, Foss writes, out of the nothingness from which the Almighty called into being, the creature brought along no rights, least of all the right to an unlosable eternal life. But Foss then adds that the point must be seen clearly that God provided the way that transcends the natural relationship. And then there's this gorgeous paragraph. Foss says, according to re the Reformed view, the covenant of works is something more than the natural bond which exists between God and man. The Westminster Confession puts this in a such a pointedly beautiful way. 7-1, quote, the distance between God and the creatures is so great that although reasonable creatures do obedience to him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. So <laughs> there, there it is. And uh, that's uh, uh, really uh, so essential to, to the theology of, of Gerhardus Foss. Now just... Uh, one further thing here, um, and that is, uh, Foss goes on to make clear that, uh, that God did not um, set aside the natural relationship, uh, in that, that as the creature, man is always subject to God, the creator. Uh, it's not set aside, um, but it's incorporated into something higher, the covenant of works, so that when Adam sins, and the higher becomes powerless and falls away, the natural relationship remains. And the result then is that the participants in the covenant of grace are exempt from the demand of the law as the condition for salvation, but they are not exempt from its demand as being normative for their moral life. Well, if uh, Foss's dogmatic sin shows his dependence upon Turretin, and the doctrine of the covenant and reform of theology shows his dependence upon the Westminster divines, then his esteem of Bobbick is seen in his review of the second volume of Bobbick's Reform Dogmatics. And you have uh, at the, at the uh, bottom of the, the handout the key paragraph uh, from that review. And so this is fascinating because this is the... Uh, the counterpart to the deeper Protestant conception. There are two places in the writings of Gerhardus Foss where he uses that type of language. One is uh, in the Reformed Dog Badge, pages 12 and 13. The other is in this review of Herman Bobbink's second volume in which uh, Foss believes that Bobbink had gotten to the heart of the Christian and Protestant uh, pr uh, position with his affirmation of uh, covenant theology. And particularly what Foss delights in is Bobbick's discussion of how Reformed and Roman Catholic theology are diametrically opposed when it comes to their treatments 
of the nature and destiny of man. This is put simply, um, Roman Catholicism has no place whatsoever in its theology. I mean, this is truly anathema. Has no place for the Reformed doctrine of the covenant of works. Conversely, uh, Reformed theology has no place whatsoever in, uh, in its theology for any concession of the donor, donum superadinum. I mean, these, this is the contrast that you see here in this review. So, um, Foss summarizes Bobbing's argument, and this is really also what you've got to understand. It is a 600-page uh, uh, systematic volume two, and Foss raves about it, how he loves it, but when it comes to the review, this is the one page and one point he picks out. And he makes a, and he, he wants us to get the importance of it. And so he says, with the nature of man and the destiny of man, the debate returns from these apologetic outposts to the heart of the Christian and Protestant position. Now, please be warned, my Latin stinks. Uh, the reformist doctrine of the donum supernaturally is shown to have two roots. One in the Neoplatonic idea of a mystical deification as the true destiny man, the other in the Pelagian principle of the meritoriousness of good works. So right there, again, this is Foss, like interpreting Foss, and he's giving you one, within one sentence, he's saying here, Roman Catholicism doesn't get the nature of man right because they're Pelagian when it comes to the nature of man. They believe in the meritoriousness of good works. They don't get the destiny of man right because they're Neoplatonic. Uh, they don't understand man was created disposed towards communion with God. It's a higher God, lower deity type of thing, and there's not true communion there, um, Foss is saying. Um, if man is to earn the status glorie, which is supernatural, he can do so only by employment of the principle likewise intrinsically supernatural, the gracia infusia or the gracia gralum fascens. So infused grace is the only way that you can get there to Rome once you have these uh, presuppositions concerning the nature and destiny of man. So Foss says, and this is the key one, the Reformed doctrine of the covenant of works differs from this in that, according to it, eternal life was not to be earned by Adam ex cognito, but ex pacto, not by the supernatural, but by natural means. <laughs> There's the Reformation in one sentence, okay? And, you, you, and we'll, we'll get to further things on that, but right there is, is, is the key difference. Um, and he's, he's putting the, the covenant of works at the heart of things there. Um, he goes on, uh, virtually Rome eliminates all grace for there's no reason to call the donum superadinum grace in any other sense than life, intellect, wisdom, power, grace were given to Adam. Christianity may, according to Rome, be an incidental and subordinate way, a soteriological scheme. Primarily it aims not at reparation, but the elevato naturally, the elevation of nature. Oh, wow. So... If you want a one-paragraph tutorial on Gerhardus Foss and uh, Herman Bobbing, if you want a one-paragraph tutorial on their modern interpreters, Cornelius Van Til and Robert Strimple, if you want a one-paragraph tutorial on the, on the theologian sitting in the back of the room, this is the paragraph right here. You get what's said here, then you're going to understand um, the, the heart of the deeper Protestant conception. Um, you see, when Rome teaches that man is created in the image of God, what it has in view is a metaphorical correspondence. However, when one points to a relationship between the cre creator and creature that consists of communion, Rome believes that the image of God is no longer in view. According to Rome, this relationship belongs to original righteousness and the donum superadidum. In other words, for Rome, man's natural gifts in the state of rectitude were not sufficient to reach the highest goal. A supernatural gift is needed for man to reach this goal. 
And this supernatural gift raises man above his created nature so that he might become a religious being who is able to love and enjoy God. But it's this gift, the, superna- uh, the donum, that's lost in the fall. But since there is no interconnection between original righteousness and image, the ru- removal of the added gift does not ruin man. After the fall, man can still do something good to merit eternal life. Now, I know I rushed through that because we're running out of time here. But what, what is this all, you know, to put it in practical terms, what does this all mean right there? Well, if you understand what Voss is saying here, this is why Rome can teach that salvation is by grace and yet see justification as a synergistic work. This is why Rome and its exegesis, like its exegesis of 1 Corinthians 2.14, does not view the the, uh, natural man as sinful man, but as man without the donum superadidum and thus capable of exercising and gifts and obtaining his natural destination. This is why the distinction between justification and the act of God's free grace wherein he pardons sins and imputes the righteousness of Christ, and sanctification, the work of God's free grace, wherein man is renewed after the image of God, is virtually eliminated in Roman Catholic thought. So you have to understand these terms for what the Roman Catholics are teaching. You have to understand them at the base in regard to the nature and destiny of man. Um, So... Foss concludes that paragraph by saying, still the Reformed theology has this in common with Rome as over against the Lutherans, that it distinguishes between the original state of man in which he was placed by creation and the ideal destiny he was yet to obtain through obedience. From the Reformed standpoint, this is expressed in the conception of the Fotis Operum, the Covenant of Works. Dr. Bob and Foss concludes, ably vindicates the federal character of all true religion. So um, that is uh, uh, Gerhardus Foss um, really at his best in regard to not only the covenant works but also covenant theology and also in one paragraph uh, really just giving you what you need in the understanding of the difference between Protestantism in a Reformed conception and Roman Catholicism. Well, that's what I've uh, talked to you about has all been his 19th century writings. He moves into the 20th century and he changes to more redemptive historical biblical theological uh, writings. Now, um, I'm running out of time here, but let me say this uh, in regard to the biblical theology and his uh, demonstration of the covenant of works through his exegesis of Genesis 2. Um, the best interpretation uh, I have ever heard of this is uh, Lane and Camden's Foss Group. So go back to episode 327, and I listen to that often, and listen to the episodes that go from 333 to 336. I mean, they're, they're so valuable that I have transcribed all of them in regard to the interpretation of the biblical theology through this section. So you're, I am not going to do as well as what they do there. But basically, Foss, again, when he gets to his 20th century biblical theological writings, he's going to show you the re- redemptive historical uh, interpretation, the exegesis, that provides the foundation for what he was talking about systematically um, you know, about the covenant of works uh, in the 19th century. So he basically says that, um, how can you, you know, Foss, how can you say all this from the simple words of Genesis 2, 16 and 17? And there's a modern reformed theologian who's basically made that exact same argument, but I won't say his name right here, but uh, Voss says uh, that the, uh, it's largely symbolic. And he, he then, in the biblical theology, uh, points to four principles um, that, that show that um, the pre-redemptive special revelation uh, 
and fleshes that out. And the first principle is the principle of life symbolized by the tree of life. According to Voss, the tree of life was associated with the higher, the unchangeable, the eternal life to be secured by obedience throughout his probation. And so if, uh, if Adam had uh, sustained the probation of the, attached to the covenant of works, the tree of life then would have been the sacramental means for communicating the higher life, the advancement of life beyond uh, the probation. So this is the way Lane puts it in the Foss Group 333 in regard to the, the tree of life and uh, in regard to its reserve for the overcomer, Revelation uh, 2.7, Lane says, Jesus overcomes and his church overcomes in him and he grants the right to, to, to that great sacramental mean, meal of glory, righteousness and life that never ends. So that's, again, so thankful for Lane. So that gives you the one sentence summary of like four pages in Voss. Um, the second principle con, uh, concerns the, the probation and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree stands in the garden of God as the God-appointed instrument to lead man through the probation to that state of religious and moral maturity wherewith his highest blessedness is connected. The purpose of the probation then at the heart of the covenant works uh, was to raise man for a moment from the influence of his own ethical inclination to a point of choosing for the sake of personal attachment to God alone. So I will leave it there because, you know what, read practically anything that uh, Cornelius Van Til has ever written about <laughs> Adam in the garden and uh, uh, that right there, and, and you'll get a pretty good sense of whether, you know, what's at stake uh, in that second principle. Um, in regard then uh, to the uh, third principle, uh, addresses the temptation and the sin uh, symbolized in the serpent. Um, and uh, um, I think, given the time, I'm going to pass that also. And then the fourth principle uh, taught was the principle of death by the dissolution of the body. And the reason why I'm passing over those, because you've got to get to the next point in the, uh, the biblical theology, which is so important. And uh, it's Voss's treatment of the Sabbath day and uh, of the Sabbath uh, and uh, uh, as connected to the eschatological goal put before man uh, in the covenant of works. Um, Foss says the Sabbath, quote, before all other important things reflects the eschatological principle on which the life of humanity has been constructed. So here's the great quote. The Sabbath brings the, the principle, this, this principle of the eschatological structure of history to bear upon the mind of man after a symbolic and typical fashion. Man is reminded in this way that life is not an aimless existence, that a goal lies beyond. This was true before and apart from redemption. The eschatological is the older strand in Revelation and the soteric. The so-called covenant of works was nothing but an embodiment of the Sabbath principle. Had its probation been successful, then the sacramental Sabbath would have passed over into the reality it typified. What now is to be expected at the end of the world would have formed the beginning of the world course instead. So again, uh, there could be a whole lecture upon that, and that is such an important part uh, for Foss's theology. But I would not be doing full justice to his teaching if I left off the hardest part. And this is probably, I think, in all of Voss's writings, the hardest part to understand. And it's the part we usually gloss. And that's his interpretation of Romans chapter 2. So you find that in two different places. You find it in the alleged, uh, his article, The Alleged uh, Legalism uh, in Paul's Doctrine of Justification. And you find that in his book, The Pauline eschatology. Now in his article, The Alleged Legalism, Foss states that Paul in Romans 2 puts forth a hypothetical argument that God will recompense obedience uh, to the law with eternal life, verses 10, 7 and 10, and the doers of the law shall be justified, verse 13. Says Foss, if a man were able to satisfy the conditions imposed, 
he would receive the reward promised. Only this hypothetical possibility does not de facto exist. No man is able to yield the required obedience. Still, this does not in the least distract from the supreme importance which the apostle ideally and theologically attaches to it as a basal principle of God's treatment of his moral creatures. So what Voss then attempts to do is to do justice to Paul in that proper exegesis of Romans 2. And in doing so, he says we must distinguish between two forensic religions. One version, the Judaistic, uh, which is dependent upon works, is one that Paul abhorred, the apostle abhorred. Foss says that the religious spirit of Paul rises in protest against this profoundly sinful system because, quote, the Judaistic spirit made itself the end and God the means, gave to itself the glory and God the part of subserving the interest of this, this human glory by his moral government, that it led the creatures to regard itself as the active and God as the merely passive factor in the determination of eternal destiny. Perhaps also that it conceived of God as by nature bound to reward man. So again, so much more can be say that, said there. I think that that's his thesis in part in the self-disclosure of Jesus. He believes that the modernists have adopted that view of religion, soteriology, ethics, and it's devoid of the glory of God. Again, another fascinating paper could be made looking at the correspondence between what he's saying there and what's happening uh, in the uh, early 20th century with the theological liberals. But I digress because the important thing here is the other version. The other version, the forensic principle of uh, divine righteousness and its twofold function of rewarding obedience and punishing disobedience, Foss says, is a supreme and an alienable attribute of God. And so Foss then in this article says that we should not get confused about which forensic religion Paul is appealing to in his doctrine of justification. Uh, he says, he writes, now it is the supreme thirst for the manifestation of the righteousness of God as an essential attribute of his nature and not a semi-conscious revival of Judaistic legalism that underlines Paul's doctrine of justification. Even though a sinner is to be treated on the principle of free love, yet the moral glory of God must uphold through a forensic transaction in which it shall appear that the righteousness of law, both positively and negatively, has been fully satisfied. And then he adds this, and this is why I'm bringing this to you. It is to the credit of Reformed theology that it has appreciated this deeper motive of the Pauline doctrine and has given it formal recognition in its conception of the covenant of works. It was enabled to do this because it took its stand the theocentrically in the supremacy of the glory of God. While equally strenuous as the Lutheran theology in upholding the soteriological importance of justification, it has gone beyond this in vindicating the purely religious significance of the principle involved. And so one last, one last um, appeal here, and that is then 27 years later, he comes to the Pauline eschatology, he revisits this text, and he revisits that article. And uh, he's not changed his mind about the passage, but his argumentation sounds a little different. This is what he says in the Pauline eschatology. It is a hypothetical argument to be sure, but nonetheless, uh, purely Paul, perfectly perfectly seriously serious and immutably valid from the standpoint of the divine procedure. Neither here nor anywhere else does the apostle assert on principal grounds that the bestowal of eternal life on the basis of fulfillment of the divine law would militate against the dignity of religion, either from the side of God or from the side of man. It should be noticed that the terms in which the apostle speaks to denote the reward are specifically eschatological terms. Glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. The passage proves that the eschatological principle is so deeply embodied in the structure of biblical religion as to proceed and underlie everything else. And so um, 
if you, if, if you took that out of the context, you wouldn't think he was talking about Romans chapter 2. You'd think he was talking about the covenant of works. And yet, here he is, is saying this about this. He goes on to state that the motive underlining Paul's championship of grace is at bottom not different from that binding him to the forensic principle of eschatological reward. So the championship of grace aims at securing the revelation of the glory of God in the soteric sphere. The forensic principle of eschatological reward aims at securing the revelation of the glory of God in the ethical sphere. And um, so this is, and then he, he closes by uh, saying this is why in his judgment, um, Calvinism proves itself to be the deepest interpretation of, of Paul, Pauline theology and insofar the purest expression of the spirit of August, uh, Augustinianism and the Reformation. Why? Because it's all for the glory of God. So that takes us back to the beginning. If I had one page to choose, I would always choose the biblical theology, uh, page 22. But there's so much more that you need to add to that. And what you need to add to that is the fact uh, that the glory of God is what's driving Foss, and he believes driving Reformed theology uh, at every point. I'll leave you with this quote um, from the... the uh, Hebrews, the epistle of Diotheke. This is how Foss ends that article. He says, Reformed theology ascribes to the Christian life a unique degree of devotion to the interest and glory of God. The believer does not merely desire to have intercourse with God, but specifically to make this intercourse subservient to glorifying God. That's what's viewed in the covenant of grace. But that's also what would have been in view if Adam had sustained the probation in the covenant of works. Communion with God in full forever in all to God's glory. Thank you. All right. Welcome back to the studio. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Lecture and that address by Danny Olinger, Gerhardus Voss, and the Covenant of Works. Always love hearing about that and love hearing Danny talk about those things. Uh, again, all the conference addresses already are available now at reformedforum.org slash rf21. And we will very soon get back to our regular programming of uh, hosting uh, interviews and panel discussions, co other conversations with uh, various guests and people, different theologians and authors. Got some really Really fun stuff coming up soon. So uh, stay tuned to the podcast feed each and every week. Every Friday, we've got new episodes coming out here of Christ the Center, as we have since January 2008. If you got any questions or feedback, comments, suggestions, those sorts of things, hit us up at mail at reformedforum.org. You can tweet us at reformedforum. And I uh, should also say, please visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate. We've been very uh, feverishly working at improving uh, our, some of our back-end systems. We're moving to a new donation management platform and uh, getting all that hooked up and connected. So it should be a much better and um, uh, just a, a really pleasant, I hope, experience for donors, especially those of you who donate monthly. We're very thankful for your commitment uh, but we're working to get through our new platform and our new processor, uh, a new donor portal working. So you'll be able to establish new recurring gifts uh, through the website. You'll also be able to log in and manage those gifts, your payment methods, your amounts, your frequencies, and see a, a history and a record of all your previous gifts directly through the donor portal without having to contact anyone. So visit reformedforum.org slash donate for up-to-date information on that. You can always call us at uh, our phone number listed on the website, which of course is 847-986-6140 or send us an email at mail at reformedforum.org Thanks so much for listening. I hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.